Shalom, everyone. Welcome back to the channel, Sakika David. I'm your host today for Absolute Knowledge of Torah. Today I have some exciting, wonderful, beautiful teaching that we're going to be getting out of Genesis chapter number 12. It's dealing with the promise that was made to our father, Avraham. Those of us who are bloodline descendants of Avraham and those of us who have joined to the house of Israel or the house of Yehuda. Um, are entitled to this promise that the Most High has made. It's a beautiful promise. Um, I'm going to bring out a lot of different points that you probably never heard before, so get a pen and paper, and here we go. We're going to be discussing this actual promise that was made to our father Abraham in Genesis chapter number 12. And let's begin as it reads. It says, And now Yahweh had said to Avram, Get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. And I will bless you. Key here is that Yah has said, I need you to leave your land, your country, and I need you to go to another land that I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you a land, right? And in this land, I'm going to make you a great nation. In this land, I'm going to bless you. In this land, uh, your uh, heritage will grow, okay? And based upon that, we're going to see other nations that are going to take part of that. He says, and I will make your name great, and you shall be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you, and you, all the families of the earth, shall be blessed. That word blessed there is called Barak, and Barak means to kneel. That's the action of that word, to kneel, as in giving, um, you know, giving some, some form of, of honor and respect, to bow down on a knee, and to kneel down, and have your hand open. Right. Like, you know, fill my hand. You know, when you ask Yah to, to bless you, you're asking him to multiply you. Right. And so what what does y'all want to bless you with? Well, it's obvious that the most high wants to give us what they call a reward. That's what he's that's what he wants to give us. And as you notice, I used in this picture again, it's about the land. This is what everything is about. But what religion has done is taken it away from the physical and put it into the spiritual. That's the reason why they needed to create the New Testament. OK, but let's go ahead and continue to find out what a reward is and what and how does it connect to Abraham? Well, in the book of Genesis, chapter number 15, verse one, after these things, the word of Yahweh came to Avram in a vision saying, do not be afraid. Avram, I am your shield, your exceedingly great reward. Why was he afraid? He was afraid because he was in a land that was unfamiliar to him. He was surrounded by nations and people that he had no idea what their customs were what their language and how they were going to behave he was scared he was a stranger so he was afraid and Yah came and visited him and said don't be afraid i'm going to be your exceedingly great reward and so that word right there reward is what Yah said he's going to be i'm going to be your shield and i'm going to be your great reward the word reward in hebrew means sakar i know it sounds familiar it sounds like yisakar which was one of the sons um, of yaakov that he received um, when his wife Leah had paid to have him be with her. He hired, she hired him that night, and he ended up having a son called Yisachar. She named him Yisachar, but she said, "You, he's my wages," because she paid to have, pa have him. So the action of this word means to hire, and the concrete is wages. So what is Yah saying? Yah is saying, "I'm going to be your shield. I'm going to, I'm going to hire you, and I'm going to give you wages. <laughs> wages for what?" Wages to be my servant. Yah doesn't have um, a group of people serve him without paying them. It would be totally against and contradictive to the Torah. So Yah is saying, I'm going to be your master and you're my servant and I want to pay you for serving me. And the way that I'm going to pay you is by giving you a reward. I'm about to give you something that um, I, I don't want to give to anyone else, but I'm going to give it to you. And what does he want to give Abraham? He showed him a land. I'm going to give you my land. I'm going to let you work my land for me. I'm going to bless that land. And also, too, um, if you teach your descendants my ways, then I'm going to actually let them live there, and I'm going to bless them, too. So let's take a look at that. So in Genesis number 18, 17 through 19, Yah was on his way to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah. But also, too, he was there to deliver a message to Avram and his wife, Sarah, to let them know that they were going to have a son called Yitzchak, okay? They both laughed. She laughed when she was in a tent. That's what his name means, laughter. But at any rate, it says this, And Yah said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I'm doing, since Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him? For I have known him. 
You hear what he said? He said, I have known him in order that he might command his children and his household after him that they keep the way of Yahweh to do righteousness and justice that Yahweh might bring to Abraham what he has promised to him. So he's saying if Abraham is to command his children and his household after him, meaning perpetually, you know, instruct them, teach them the way of Yahweh, right? To guard Yahweh's way, because the word keep there means shamar. Shamar means to guard or keep, keep watch over to observe the way of Yahweh. To do what? To do righteousness and justice. Then Yahweh says, when if he does these things, I'm going to bring about what I promised to Abram. And what did he promise Abraham? He said, I'm going to be your shield. I'm going to protect you. And I'm going to be your great reward. I'm going to be your sakar. Okay, I'm going to make you, um, I'm going to give you wages. What? For being my servant. So we find in the study here that what is the way of Yahweh? That's a question, you know, and what is what was it that he commanded his children? Well, we know in Genesis 26, 5, it says that Abram kept all the ways of Yahweh. He kept all his mitzvot and his commandments. And so what we see here is that this wasn't operative or based on them believing anything only you know, like have faith alone with nothing else. It was actually doing something physically, meaning to keep the ways of righteousness and justice. By what? Looking out for the poor, looking out for the widow, being hospitable like Abraham was. Um, he had great wealth. He had household servants. And he had to know how to live among um, Yah as his servant to be in the land that, that Yah was promised him. As you know, Yah gave him um, all the land of Israel. All the land of Canaan. He told him that when you get there, every place you step your foot is going to be yours. And he pronounced that covenant upon not only himself, Avram, but also to Yitzchak and also to Yaakov. Okay, um, but we need something, right, in the land, right? And so we're going to talk about that. What do we need for land? Well, in Hebrew, it's called Geshem. Okay, and this is not only for our land, but it's for all lands. They need showers. They need rain. Okay. Um, if you don't have any rain, you don't have um, any produce, you don't have any vegetables, any fruits, nothing can grow. Um, it becomes desolate. It becomes um, a ruin. It becomes uh, uninhabitable because there's nothing there. There's no sustainability. And so that's why Yah created the heavens and the earth so he can bring the water down from the heavens to the earth. So let's take a look at what he says in Leviticus chapter number 26. He says this, if, I want you to remember that word, you walk in my statutes and keep my covenant or excuse me, my commandments, and perform them, meaning to observe them, to do them, then I will give you rain in its season. So you can see there's a direct correlation and connection between rain and keeping Yahweh's statutes and His commandments. The land shall yield its produce. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit. Your threshing time shall last to the time of the vintage, and the vintage shall last till the time of sowing. And you shall eat bread and to the full and dwell in your land safely, and I will give shalom, peace, in the land, and you shall lie down, meaning go to sleep, and none shall make you afraid. I will rid the land, meaning get rid of all the evil beasts that are in the land, because they had evil beasts running around, which <laughs> were trying to bring harm to the children of Israel, and the sword will not go through your land, okay? And so we can get into that. But what we notice is that if and then, okay? If you walk in my statutes and commandments and you perform them, you don't only walk in them, right? physically, but spiritually also, you have to be able to do them, but also too, then I will give you rain in its season. So what we recognize is that Yah created the heavens, right? And he calls upon them to be a witness between him and Israel. And if Israel doesn't do what he says, then in, the rain won't come in its seasons. And then they won't have produce, they won't have fruit, they won't have wine, they won't have bread, and they won't have any peace. And the reason that he's given this rain and this fruit and this vintage and this bread is not just so the benefit of them as a, as a reward is them being a servant, but also, too, is to recognize where it came from. It came from the Holy One of Israel. And it's based upon the covenant that he made with Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov. But it's all contingent upon our obedience to what the statutes and the commandments. And the reason why he gives the rain in his seasons is because after every season, we were required to bring gifts to Yahweh, which was the fruit, the vintage, and the bread, and the produce, and that of the animals, and the sheep, and the and the, the cows, and whatnot. And so if we were doing what we were supposed to have done, then everything would be copacetic. Everything would be going well. If we did not do what we were supposed to have done, then we would have a shortage of these things, and then everyone would suffer, including the fatherless, the widow, the stranger, and even ourselves. And so 
there's a direct connect between the land, the rain, and our obedience. And so that's the reason why, you know, right now rain for us doesn't really mean that much. It means it's bad weather or we can't go outside or we got to be careful when we're driving. But back in Israel, in our land, it actually is representative of that of our obedience, right? And I don't know if you know this, but rain has a connect to the word Torah because it's called Yara, meaning to point in a direction. So when rain falls down, it's being shot in a different in a, in a direction. It's supposed to just like the Torah. So there's a connection there. But the reward and the benefits, of course, as you can see, has to do with the produce. It has to do with the fruit, the vintage, the bread, and peace. And so these are the benefits. And like I've been talking about, you know, I get on a lot of people about, you know, they always talk about that which is spiritual, but they never talk about that which is physical. And so we notice that the fruit is uh, physical, the fruit, the produce, the vintage, the wine, the bread, and even the peace and, and the state of mind to live in this is what I'm looking for. Okay, so when he talks about bringing us back to our land, these are the, the benefits and the rewards of the, the descendants of Abraham if they were be obedient. Okay, and this is what a lot of people are going to be forfeiting. Okay, they're going to forfeit the, the fruit, the vegetables, uh, the wine, the bread, and the shalom. Because Yah says that an, um, a rebel will not go back into the land, okay? Just like he disinherited our fathers who came out of Egypt and they had a you know, really nasty attitude. They were very bitter and they wanted to hold on to the gods that they were serving from the, who they learned in the land of their oppression. Like us today, we're serving the God of the United States of America. Well, I used to. I don't serve that one. And his son, Yeshua, or his son, JC, just depending if you're white or black, determines you know what, what's his name for you. But at any rate... The gods of the other countries is where they try to continue to hold on to. And Yah says, no, you can't have that because it gives you a frame of mind and a mindset. You know, you're becoming more spiritual instead of more physical. So he says this in Jeremiah chapter 5, verse 23 through 25. But this people has a defiant and rebellious heart, as I've been saying. They have revolted and departed from what? From the Torah. They do not say in their heart, let us now fear the Yahweh, our Elohim, who gives what? Rain. He gives rain both the former and the latter, in its season. Why? I've talked about the seasons that it has, right? He reserves for us the appointed weeks of harvest. This was huge in our, um, our, our culture, in our custom. Agriculturally speaking, it was a matter of life or death for us, right? And so he's saying, your iniquities have turned these things away and your sins have withheld good from you. Meaning, again, the connection is if you sin against Yah, um, you actually change nature. Because Yah won't send the He won't send the rain, so you've actually changed the seasons. You've caused disruption in 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 the earth because of your sins, your iniquity. And He says your sins have withheld this good from you, right? So when He talks about the you know the sins have withheld good from you, meaning you can't have any vintage, you can't have any bread, you can't have any shalom, you can't sit down and, and eat some bread with some olive oil and a glass of wine and some cheese or none of that because. You want to continue in iniquity. You want to continue to call upon the names of other gods of the places where you have been scattered to or the ones that you have brought along with you when you try to go to the land, which is not going to happen. This is not going to happen when we go back to the land. Um, what we find, too, here in Leviticus chapter number 26, 40 through 44, we're going to go through each verse. It says, but if they confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers with their unfaithfulness in which they were unfaithful to me and that they also walk contrary to me, and that I have also walked contrary to them, and I have brought them into the land of their enemies, if their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, and they accept their guilt. So before we continue on to the next verse, I want to talk about what our iniquity is of our fathers. Number one, they didn't teach us the Torah, so that's why we don't know it. Okay, They weren't faithful to Yah by being faithful to the covenant, which he, he said, or they agreed that we'll do everything you said. So they were unfaithful to him. So he said, I'm going to be contrary. You're contrary to walking in my ways. I'm going to show you that I'm contrary to you. And the proof of that is, he says, and brought them into the land of their enemies. If you're in the land of your enemies, as we are today, then you should know that you and I have been contrary to the Most High. And it's because of our ancestors who didn't do their job of teaching the Torah. Uh, our ancestors didn't teach us about Christ. They didn't teach us about the Christianity. They didn't teach us about this because they had no clue about it. They didn't understand. You didn't get that until you came to this land. Okay, And if their uncircumcised hearts are humbled, and they accept their guilt. Accepting our guilt and having an uncircumcised heart, meaning that you and I have to understand that we don't fully understand um, the things of Yah. We have to understand that there's some guilt. And when you find someone else to die for your sin, you can never really accept your guilt because you put your guilt on someone else and you kill the righteous when you're wicked and you expect to be delivered, which is not going to happen.
Okay, let's continue to read. It says also too that in verse number 42, then, remember it says, if they confess, now it's then, I want you to remember that, then I will remember my covenant with Yaakov, my covenant with Yitzchak, and my covenant with Abraham, I will remember. What? If they confess. Not if someone dies for your sins. Then he says, I will remember the land. Remember, we started off talking about the what? The land, because that's what Yah had promised to Abraham, to Yitzchak and Yaakov. He says, the land shall also be left empty by them. Meaning, in this discussion in 26, he's talking about if they didn't keep the Sabbaths, what he was going to do to them. And he did that. He says, the land also shall be left empty by them, and, I will, and it will enjoy its Sabbaths. Why it lies desolate without them. That's the reason why we're not there is because we violated the Kukim, which is the one of the laws that the Most High talks about us releasing the land after every uh, seven years or every six years and we let it rest in the seventh. We were not giving the land a Sabbath. So the Sabbath is not just a day for us to rest, but it was a day or a year for the, for the land to rest because we ourselves come from the land and the land itself needs to be rested as well. And because we violated that, he says it's going to lay desolate without them. And they will accept their guilt because they have despised my judgments, and um, because my soul, uh, and because their soul abhorred my statutes. We abhorred him. We didn't want to do what he says. Our ancestors didn't want to do it. But he said we have to accept our guilt. You can't put your guilt on Christ. You can't put your guilt on anyone else. You have to accept it for yourself, and that's what this is about. Physically, okay, it has spiritual implications, but physically that's where it's at. And let's finally look at. He says yet. For all that, when they are in the land, the L-A-N-D, the physical land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, nor shall I abhor them to utterly destroy them and break my covenant with them. For I am Yahweh their Elohim. Well, why is he not going to do this? Because, as you can see, he's given the land its rest. He's given it the Shabbat that it needed without us. And he's saying, um, I'm not going to destroy them or abhor them like they did me. Okay, But for their sake, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought out of the land of Mitzrayim. So who is the ancestors that he brought out of the land of Mitzrayim? The ones that he brought out of Mitzrayim. Our ancestors, here he's not talking about Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, because he didn't bring them out of the land of Mitzrayim. He brought our ancestors out, the ones who detested, abhorred his judgments and his rulings. When he talks about judgments and his rulings, he's just talking about the regulations on how one was supposed to live in the land. You know, because there's requirements when you live in a land that's Yahweh's land. You have to live in righteousness and justice. And that's what he told Abraham again in Genesis 18, that if you teach them how to guard my way and learn how to te treat the fatherless and learn how to treat the widow and learn how to treat the stranger and be fair to the foreigner and be fair to one another and be forgiving and, and just and right and, and, you know, don't hate, don't kill, don't sleep with anybody's wife and any of those types of things, then you show me that you don't abhor me, right? He says, but for their sake, in 45, I will remember the covenant of their ancestors whom I brought out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the nations, that I might be their Elohim, meaning I'll be their power, their deliverer, their savior, for I am Yahweh. And if you notice, he never changes his name. He never calls himself by any other name but Yahweh. There is no other name. There is no other name that uh, we recognize as the one who delivered our ancestors. And the one who delivered them will also be the same one who delivers us out of our captivity as well, if we confess and we acknowledge our guilt and that we've been going contrary to him. So he's asking us to do that. And with that being said, you understand now that the, uh, the uh, Sakar is the reward, you know, and it's found in, you know, Ezekiel 36. It's found through all the prophets where he talks about them being scattered and me, me gathering them. You know, if you go back to, you know, Leviticus 26, he talks about, well, you guys, you know, did this on the Sabbath. So until the land is paid back as Sabbath, I'm going to send you away until you pay for what you've done. So it's a, a matter of a timeline. But within that time frame, he's asking us to change, okay, and to turn from our ways. Okay, so Ezekiel 36, uh, verse 28 through 30, he says, Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people, and I will be your Elohim. Well, what fathers did he give the land to? He gave them to our fathers, Abraham, Yitzhak, and Yaakov, because that's the heritage, right? I will deliver you from all your uncleannesses. Well, when you go back to the land, I will call for the grain so you can see that this is physical and I will multiply it, meaning he'll bless it. I will multi multiplicity means blessing. OK, and I will bring no famine upon you and I will multiply the fruit of your trees and your increase of your fields so that you need, ne need never again to bear the reproach of famine among the nations. Among the nations, you and I don't have any food. Among the nations, you and I don't can't just go get fruit off our tree. We can't go into our own fields and we can't go into our own land and we can't 
uh, capture any grain. So we're we're literally in famine, and you know we're dependent upon them. And the moment they close the store, it's over. That's the bottom line. So you know those of us who 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 understand what's going on, and I'm not going to put those who want to go to heaven down. I'm just going to tell you that you don't understand what's really going on. You're actually going to get disinherited because you don't want that which is in front of you, which you can see, smell, taste. And that's the Hebraic way. We use all five senses. And so we're not, we, we are spiritual, but we're spiritual in terms of application of that which is physical. We don't look to um, some man dying for our sins. We don't look to um, other people feeding us. We don't look to, um, you know, anyone else but Yah. We look for him for rain. We look for him for sustenance. We look for him for produce. We look for him for bread. We look for him for all good things. We look for him for salvation, meaning safety and security from, from the enemy and from wild beasts. And, you know, there's other places in, in the scripture that talks about how he's going to make a covenant with the animals so they won't attack us. He's going to make a covenant with the insects so they don't bother us. And so there's a lot of um, benefits to being the children of Israel. So in our teaching today, we learned that the Sakar is the reward for being Yahweh's servant. If we abandon Yahweh's war, uh, laws and statutes and commandments, we'll end up being um, disinherited. We were sent here into the other lands of our enemies to learn our lesson and to learn what it means to follow Yah so he can reign upon our land. And, and also by that, we may be able to have shalom. We may be able to have peace and joy and may be able to increase our numbers as uh, our descendants, as he has stated. And so that can only happen if we take on the attitude of our father, Abraham, Yisak, and Yaakov, being obedient and um, being um, not rejecting him but coming to him and confessing our guilt and that of our ancestors and saying that I want to come back and do exactly what you asked me to do. And within that, you're going to be our exceedingly great reward. And we bless Yahweh for that. So I want to say thank you and shalom to you um, for spending your time today on, you know, absolute knowledge of Torah. Hallelujah. Praise Yah.